uh, the DHT one is one of the principal components of uh, LIP2P and IPFS in order to find content. And um, so we've studied how it works in practice, we've measured it, and that's where we're gonna dive in. So first, um, let me give you a quick introduction of what is DHT, what's a distributed hash table. So it is basically a um, computer overlay network, which means that nodes are connected to the same network using the internet, and uh, the overlay network is node participating in this DHT, um, will be connected to each other on top of the internet. And so the abstraction that the DHT gives us is um, it is a distributed uh, key value store where you can find um, the location of some content according to the content itself. So it is, um, so all of the store, thank you. So all of the data is stored in a flat key space, which means that if some files have a similar, um, similar name of some, some similarities, there will be no similarity to the location where they are actually stored in the DHT. Um, and why do we have a DHT? What are the trade-offs there? So if we have n node in a network, so what we could do is, is just keep track of every single node in this network so that we can uh, reach to them directly and it will be fast, but then it doesn't really scale because we have to keep a very large state. Um, alternatively, we could keep track of only a small amount of peers, but then if we want to look up for some content in this network, we have to iterate through all of the peers and it's not efficient. So the trade-off is we want to keep track of log n of peers and it allows us to efficiently have a, a lookup um, of log n complexity, which means that we have log n hops uh, in order to, to reach the content. So now some specificity. So IPFS and LIP2P implement the Kademlia DHT. So we use a key space of 256 bits. Um, so each node in the network has its own peer ID, um, which format you've maybe already seen, and it can also be represented as a 256 bit, so it lives in this key space. Um, and the content also live in the same key space uh, as the peer IDs. So the locality, uh, let's say in this um, key space, is based on the XOR distance between uh, the, so the, the bits. Um, the DHT itself in IPFS doesn't store content, except in the case of IPNS, but it stores pointers to the content, which means that if I'm looking for, uh, if I want to publish a file to the DHT or to IPFS, then the file is gonna stay on my machine and I'm just gonna advertise that I have this file. So if someone is looking for this file, um, come and reach out to me. And um, so the way, uh, let's say the, the state, so how we keep track of the peer is organized, is that each peer um, keep, so sorts the, the other peers they know um, by logarithmic uh, XOR distance and stores them in one what we call K buckets. So I'm gonna focus a bit more on this. So now if we take an example, so this is an, um, an existing uh, network, so let's say it's Kademlia, and each of the peers there um, are represented, so the peer ID are um, yeah, just uh, bit strings. So uh, just for convenience, it's not 256 bits for an identity, but just four bit, but you get the ID. Then we have one new peer that wants to join the network, so that's the one in green. And what it needs to join the network is a bootstrap node. So it means that if you want to join the club, you got to know someone. Otherwise, you cannot um, yeah, join this network, which is obvious. So you need to know at least someone. And so what we can represent, so that's um, the tree with the XOR distance. I'm going to get to this later. But uh, in order to get to know some more peers in the network, um, so the green node, the new one, needs to ask um, 
the other peers is no. Okay, can you uh, give me some more peers? I need to uh, fill in my address book in order to be able to communicate efficiently with the network. So what it's going to do is going to look for itself. So it's going to ask um, the, the peer it knows, okay, can you give me some peers that are close to me? And the other is going to say, sure. Um, so in this case, you can ask 1100, which is closer to the green node. And then, so iteratively, um, the, the new node is going to search for itself. So um, ask all of the peers it knows, give me some peers that are close to me. And eventually, um, it will learn to know uh, some new peers. And so that's how a node will fill in uh, its routing table. So it keeps track of all of the visited peers. Um, so once the, the node has joined the network, it will periodically look up, look up for itself um, in order to keep, so uh, a node has to know all of the, the peer IDs that are in the close neighborhood. So here, it will be the nodes that are around like in orange. Um, when you perform a request for some content or for some peers, it is the same as it's the, the, the same key space. Uh, the, so the request is iterative and is resolved similarly. Um, the request happens concurrently, which means that you don't need to wait for the answer of a single peer. You just ask multiple peer at the same time and you get many answers. So when you get a request for some key, what you're going to do to help the other find the content it's looking for is you're going to look in your own routing table and give the 20 closest peers to this content so that the, the peer has some choice um, to go and find this content. Um, when you publish some provider records or some pointer uh, pointing to the content you are hosting in the DHT, you will push it to 20 uh, peers, so the 20 closest peers to this content identifier. And so each bucket, I'm going to come back to the bucket later, is capped at 20 peers. And please note that these three constant, so the 20 closest peer to the requested key, um, the, the replication index, and the bucket capacity uh, are the same value in IPFS, but they don't necessarily need to be the same value. So those are three distinct constant. And so now if we come back to the key space and the key bucket, um, so as we say, a node can learn about some other peers and it will sort them um, inside buckets. And so for, we'll, we'll give IDs to the bucket in order to uh, yeah, just name them. And so the bucket number zero is for the bucket that are far away in the short distance um, from the node itself. And so it is the peer that share a common prefix of zero bits. So here in this case, we'll take still the same node as a reference node. And the nodes that are far away from, from this node, um, so this one, if, so if our reference node were to learn about them, it would put them in the bucket number zero because they are far away. And then for the bucket number one, so that's the peer that are closer and that share a prefix of length one, and it would place them into bucket number one. Then we go on bucket number two, number three, and as we get closer and closer, there is gonna be less candidates. So what we expect, so now imagine you have a tree of depth, not four, but 256. So the buckets that are far from you are going to be full because there are so many candidates to fall in this bucket, but the bucket close to you are going to be totally empty because there's just no one that has this prefix. And so that's kind of what you would expect. So at each bucket, you um, divide the number of candidates um, per two. And so uh, something that is also important in these K buckets is how do you select the peers? So it's simple, when you learn uh, about a new peers that you didn't know before, you just compute in which bucket it will belong. If there is some place left in it, then you just put in there. But if the bucket is already full, you just don't take it. It's on the waiting list. And then um, 
regularly, the, the, the peers will probe all of the peers in the charting table, and if they fail to reply, they will get evicted, and that's how new peers can um, get inside the routing tables. And so that's, um, so eventually only the very stable nodes are gonna be in there because the ones that are not stable are gonna get evicted. So we performed some, some measurement and we used the Nebula crawler to crawl the network and it has technique to get the routing table of every single peers uh, in the network. So that's pretty awesome. And so we took some data, it was earlier in April this year. And yeah, so the Nebula crawler can give us a global snapshot of the routing table of all of the peers at one specific point in time. Um, so yeah, so the Nebula crawler gives us this, this snapshot. And from this, so we know all of the peers of the network and all of the routing tables of all the peers. So we can uh, reconstruct the K bucket for every single peer. And as we have a global knowledge of the network, we can verify if um, some peers should belong to some buckets, but they're already missing from there. Um, and also we can look up, so one of the property of uh, Kademlia is the routing is sound uh, only if you know all of your closest neighbors and your closest neighbor know you. Because if your closest neighbors in a short distance do not know you, then you cannot expect anyone to route to you if nobody knows you in the network. And so that's what we wanted to verify. So um, the first graph we have is um, displaying the, the, the ratio of unreachable peers. So it means that we took um, all the routing tables and we tried to uh, probe each one of the peers. And so that's the ratio of peers that were in the routing table but that were not reachable at the time of the crawl, which means that there are stale entries. They are in the routing table, but they are useless. We don't really want them. And um, so 0 dot, uh, yeah, 16, so 16% 16 is very low. Um, so it means that, um, yeah, so out of the 20 closest peers, it's um, only like, uh, yeah, like a couple of peers that are missing, and we were expecting much more. And we can see a difference between the bucket with a low ID, so bucket zero to, let's say, eight, and the bucket nine plus. And so bucket zero to eight is the bucket that are full. They have many candidates, and so they will uh, easily replace the unreachable peers. And the others may keep the dead peer for longer because they don't have much candidate to, to join this bucket, and it takes more time to, uh, yeah, to clean up. Second result, so that's the peer distribution in the bucket. So uh, on the um, x-axis, you have the bucket ID. So it means that bucket zero, one, and so on are far from you. And the buckets, so we have up to bucket 20, are close from you. So we can see that the bucket um, up to number eight are almost always full, which means that um, there are a lot of candidates there. and. Um, uh, yeah, so they, they are capped, there will be some more. And as we go down, we can see the exponential decrease. Um, that is expected because, as we said before, we expect the number of candidates to be divided by two um, for when we increase the bucket ID. And so in our range, we can see the missing peers, um, which is, um, so in blue, that's the number of peer per bucket that we observed from the routing table of the peers. And in orange, it's the peers that were not in this routing table, but that we observed in the network. So it means that they were missing from this bucket. And we can see that this number is very, yeah, it's very low. It's a bit high for the bucket num ID number nine and plus, but it's still very, very acceptable. Now, about the 20 closest peer awareness. So as I said, you have to know your neighbors and your neighbor have to know you in order for the routing to, to work. And so the result we got is that um, 50 uh, sorry, 61 percent of the peer know all of their 20 closest peer, which is uh, excellent. And that 95 percent of the peers um, 
know uh, at least 18 out of the 20 peers. And it is not a critical failure if you are missing one of the peers because you, in order to be discoverable, you need at least one peer in your close neighborhood to know you in order to be accessible. So that's, again, very good stats. And in fact, we would not expect to have um, 20 peers because when you look up for yourself, so you're going to get the 20 closest peer to your own identity and you're going to be included in this identity. So in fact, we expect um, each node to know more than 19 closest peers plus itself to itself. And now, yep. On the previous slide, you showed the CDF and PDF, and like, I'm wondering where the math for that comes from. Where the math come from? Yeah, or? yeah exactly. So it means that um, here we have 60% um, of the peer that know all of the 20 closest peer. We have like 25% that know 19 out of 20. We have like what is it, like 5%, 7% that know 18 uh, out of 20, and so on. And so we have like almost no peers that know only 10 out of the 20 peers. Uh, yeah, it's the average on the snapshots. So like it's empirically, like, empirically derived data, right? It's not, or. Yeah, it's based on measurements. So yeah, that's um, the, the, the good news we have. And then something a little bit more concerning is that the diversity in the bucket, which means the number, the total number of uh, distinct peer IDs in, um, let's, let's say, all bucket number zero. So if you take the bucket number zero of all of the peers and you count the number of distinct peer inside these unions of bucket, um, it tends to um, decrease over time, and which is a bit bad for uh, yeah, just load balancing and decentralization because it means that if you are to reach a peer that is on the other side of the network, um, it's going to be only a small set of peers that are going to take all of the requests. So we also did some measurement on that. So that was distinct data from the first measurement, so we can see that the number of peers is, was approximately constant. And what we got is, so when we, so yeah, let me explain this graph. So when we take the bucket number zero for all of the peers and count the distinct number of peer IDs in there, um, we reached um, these numbers. So uh, we yeah, counted for each week, and we have number, week number zero and week number nine, so that was the, all the, the duration of the study. And what we can see is that the bucket that is the most diverse is bucket number nine, which, um, if we recall, was the first bucket to be um, not, not full. And so we would expect to have more diversity in the bucket that are full, right, because there are more folks there. But the thing is, um, that over time, as we tend to keep the very stable peers inside our bucket with a lot of candidates, we're going to keep the very stable one, and the very stable one are going to end up in every peer's uh, bucket number zero and one. And so over time, we will get rid of the unstable peers and only accept the stable one, which is good because now you have a stable network. But then it is centralized because um, all, of the, all of these very stable peers start to get lots of requests, and so it doesn't scale anymore. And so what we can see here is that um, the, the diversity is decreasing over time, and I don't, yeah, probably it will stop at some point, but the worst case is that the bucket number zero is centralized. We have only 40 different peers, so 20 for each uh, half of the key space, and that would be just terrible. But I mean, yeah, we're, we're not that there yet, and so that's the moving average of the, of the difference. So we can see, so the um, diversity in bucket number nine in green is always higher than the, the one in um, the bucket zero and one. But what we can see is that the diversity is decreasing much faster in the buckets with a low ID 
than in bucket with a higher ID. And so yeah, it means that we are converging to less and less peers, and that's not good. So yeah, uh, um, yeah another, maybe an improvement that we could have is that currently, um, when an IPFS node uh, leaves the network, so you shut down your computer or you just kill the uh, IPFS or Kubo process, um, you're gonna flush everything, and when you open up the computer again, you're gonna have to insert yourself again in the DHT and do again all of the lookup and um, get to know some other peers. And what could be good um, for uh, centralization, I mean, to come, the, yeah, to fight the, uh, centralization and uh, to make the, the boot up process faster is to keep a state. So you, um, when you shut down your, your node, you just write your uh, routing table or the peer, the peer list on your disk, and when you boot up, you try to contact the same peers again so that you converge much faster when you boot up and you avoid to uh, get those central boot, bootstrap nodes uh, directly in your routing table. Uh, because that's the most popular and stable one. And so uh, th they get less requests and we have a faster convergence. And now I'm gonna give an explanation on <laughs> this graph. <laughs> so <laughs> actually it's a very new graph. I think we had it like two days ago. And the explanation we have, why we can see so many clusters and so many colors, um, it's always gonna be group uh, of power of two. So if we can see the largest, um, uh, let's say, empty space that we get is between the left and the right, okay? So that's like two groups. And then we can see another big line between the up and the down. So it's another line. And then we can split each one of these quarter in two. So that's the color. And inside each of the color, we can yeah, clearly see um, that th th there are two distinct groups. And sometimes you can even see four distinct groups uh, in this color. So each subgroup of a color has, again, two subgroups. And so the way we can explain this is the, the larger, let's say, DMZ or empty space um, means that, for instance, on the left, we have all of the nodes that start with the prefix zero and on the right, all of the ones that start with the prefix one. And because they form a cluster together. So if we take it from the bottom, um, let's take the two same reference nodes again. Um, these nodes are gonna be closer together, so they will always be um, connected together and form a cluster. And then when we look to the closest node to them, it's gonna be those two guys. And um, it is bijective, so those two guys are going to be the closest to this one, and so they're going to form a cluster. Yep, go ahead. Take one of the peer IDs as a sample, how would you plot it on this chart? How do I take a peer ID and then plot it on this plane? So like 1001, where does it correspond to on the, on like, on the plot? So we'll have to um, have a, a mapping between the colors and prefix. So what it means is each color is a, is a distinct prefix. And so what you take is you take just the, yeah, the prefix of a node. Okay. And you can it. place it ac according to the color. So let's say, for instance, if we define some arbitrary prefix, the left is going to be uh, zero and the right is going to be one. Okay. And then upper left is maybe zero, zero. Got it. And then down left is going to be zero, one. Okay, so there's three bits plotted here. Is that right? There's, um, eight, there's eight segments? Yeah, the colors are three bits, but then each color is divided in two, so that's four bits. And then each subsection is divided in two again. And what determines the radius of the point or how far it is from the origin? Um, wh what do you mean the origin? I see a bunch of dots on the screen with different colors, and some of them are farther from the origin of that plot than other ones. So what determines whether a node is plotted farther from the origin or closer? Um, the numerical value associated with the peer ID, or what? I don't. I might be overanalyzing the chart, but I'm just trying to figure out how I go from a peer ID to a color in a space on that grid, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I think it's very delicate to have a two-dimensional representation of these connections because the Kademniak source space. So if we have 
let's say, n-bit keys um, is going to live in n-bit dimensions. So that's just like a projection but in 2D. you plotted it on 2D. So how do I go from a pure ID to a 2D plot? <laughs> Strip off the prefix, give it a color, and then with the remaining bits, how do I locate it in space? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, uh, the way the image was generated, I don't exactly know. So okay. I, I can't say exactly for the location. So why is it left or right or more on the outside or on the inside um, of the thing? But um, so th the explanation is more for the cluster. So how are nodes grouped together? And yeah, so um, so to conclude this uh, presentation, so we say that the the DHT is in a very good shape. So we have um, so we know all of the peers that are close to us, and uh, there there are a really low rate of uh, dead peers inside the network, so stale entries. Um, the distribution inside the K buckets uh, is as expected. So we can see the exponential decrease as the um, bucket um, index increases. Um, and we have, um, and yes, yeah, so the only concerning thing maybe is that we lose diversity over time, but um, there are some, some solution to, to tackle this, and it's not critical at the moment. All right, so that was it.